Hello, and welcome to my podcast, Where the Dark Corners Are. Hello, hello. I am Vina, and I am your Dark Travels hostess. Tonight, we're going to close out our trip to Italy, Italy, Florence-ish, with a with a newcomer, actually. It's her first podcast. We're kind of liking Slashers with Samantha as her introduction. Thoughts? Yeah, yeah definitely. Thank you for having me. Happy to be here. So this is, I get now, Slasher, Slasher Samantha. And so with that kind of tell-all nickname, we're here to talk about a slasher, a killer. Yeah, he's a pretty bad dude. <laughs> <laughs> She's struggling with the words. <laughs> yeah, like to put it mildly, like this man's awful. Now, we were briefly speaking prior to the podcast. You've been to Florence. I've been to Italy, but Rome specifically. So my cousin did do a little stint in Florence, but I was down more in the mainland and uh, visiting all the coliseums, like the Disneyland of Italy. Okay. It was beautiful. But you did you make your way to Florence or just... <sighs> well, I was poor. I was like 19. Okay. I was lucky my parents even got me to Rome. And Starving so, artist. Oh, uh-huh. for sure. Starving student. <laughs> I was working two jobs, so it was like there was so much to see in Rome that... It didn't feel like there was any need to go outside of Rome, but we did go to Pompeii, and we went to Sorrento, and we went to Capri, so we went to, like, little places around there, but we didn't get on the train and go anywhere else. Uh, for the record, I officially love Pompeii. It's so freaking cool, other than the fact that there's dicks everywhere. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it's, like, shocking to people. They're literally etched in stone, guys. Oh, my God. There's stone rocks pointing to the brothels. You Correct. walk in, and there's, That's like, how you find... I mean, one... So one of the things, and to me, this was beyond, I I was just so impressed with this thinking. A lot of people don't understand that Pompeii was a seaport. Mm -hmm. Seafaring town, yeah. And as such, they had an influx of people who didn't speak Rome or Italian. Italian. Yeah, same Romanian. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Anyways, Rome. (laughs) They didn't speak Rome. I like it. Point is... I mean, you're talking, even at that time, you had Egyptians coming in, you had Greeks coming in, you had Spaniards coming in, and even though a lot of these these languages are Latin-based, they're still diverse, and they're predominantly men. and men men on the sea. (laughs) Right. (laughs) You know, the boats are rocking, don't come a-knocking. For sure. So, obviously, they're looking to have a little bit of a... (laughs) Relief, <laughs> right. <laughs> and so the Pompeians just had this, in my mind, the most awesome concept of etching penises in the stone, in the street cobblestone. Mm-hmm. And the idea was you're supposed to follow the direction of the head of the penis mm-hmm. And that would lead you directly to the whorehouses, yep. right? To the brothels. So yeah, <laughs> and I just, I mean, what an amazing! And they didn't have like posters. No. Well, you walk in and they have all those paintings above the stone. Right. Beds Once that, you get to the brothels, uh-huh, yeah. yeah, you're like number one. I'll take uh-huh, number one exactly. with the number two. Just no like sauce. <laughs> Ketchup on the side. Yep. And her and her. <laughs> Maybe a little ham. You know. <laughs> well, yeah, Romans. <laughs> yes. So. <laughs> That, to me, was just amazing. I mean, how do you get around the language issue? And uh, Pompeii nailed it. Mm-hmm. So It was fascinating. And it's a dichotomy because you're there, and it's, like, up in the mountains. So to try to picture the fact that it was covered by ocean at some point is it's right. weird. It's hard to, like, reconcile that. Right. Or, and buried under so much dirt, thanks mm-hmm. to Mount Vesuvius, obviously, mm-hmm. when it uh, took everybody out. 
Yeah, it was crazy. It was a, an experience for sure. Right. You're literally walking in the footsteps, of not only Romans, but in history. Mm-hmm. So, but we're here actually to discuss this situation that happened in Florence. Yes. So we're here to talk about the monster of Florence. And over the last, cu- well, not the last couple of years, over a course of 17 years, a serial killer terrorized the beautiful and scenic reg- region of Tuscany and Florence, which are close to each other. He brutally killed eight couples at a lover's lane, which were popular lover's lanes areas, and the mysteries were never solved. So they left this country reeling, and now the victims parents and families are coming forth and trying to get it reopened so that's why this is kind of a hot topic right now because as soon as very recently we've had a lot of families coming forward and being like you guys could have solved this why didn't you solve this let's get it figured out so so i mean hashtag spoilers this is an unsolved crime in italy but one of the things to remember i think this happened in the 80s ish it was 1974, or no, 1968, and 1985, to 1985, so 17 years. Okay, and I mean, we're just in the 80s on the cusp of DNA, mm-hmm. so I mean, the families rightfully should be asking for a review here. I mean, every day we read about how this this murder was solved, or this unfortunate person met their demise and the killer was so and so because of the possibilities with dna today right we've made great advancements and i think the one thing that we're going to see and no offense to italians because i am italian and i love italian heritage and culture we find that they fumble a lot of stuff look at amanda knox so it seems like they kind of chose their own way and even in this we'll see that they go through peeping toms and this radical thing and a spar- spurred lover and all these other things and you're like well you guys didn't even put together this was a serial killer for like three murders with the exact same mo so right. it's really interesting all right so let's let's go dark let's go florence dark yeah let's see what happens <laughs> so this prolific serial killer was dubbed the murder of florence or in italian il Mun- monstro di Firenze. It was, he incendiated, incendi- I cannot say that word. He targeted couples who were engaged in sexual activity in remote areas between the years of 1968 and 1985, like we discussed before. And a few sub- suspects emerged and were convicted over the years. However, they believe that they've never truly found the murderer that's done this. So some serious injustice is happening here. Yeah, I mean, I think as we go through it, we'll see that they had a lot of evidence and a lot of very specific evidence that they just did not follow. Okay. So the person must have been, I think, to some degree, somebody who hated people who were in love. I mean, if this is their victim profile, it just seemed to me like, or I mean, I guess we'll see. This man clearly hated women. So we'll see that as we go on that he focused a lot on his female victims. So I think there was, like you said, a certain level of resentment for people that were in love, but he was also a stalker and he, I think less was angry that they were in love and more realized that when you had your pants around your ankles, that you were easier to attack. And thus he did. Right. Okay. Well, that also makes an easier target, which is probably the point. Right. So we'll see that as we go on. Okay. So Tell us about the monster of Florence. Well, the really interesting thing about this guy is that his modus operandi, which is MO for most people, so a lot of people don't realize what MO actually means. So there you go, listeners. Modus operandi. It's Latin. It was exactly the same from all of these victims. So they were normally in parked cars. They were alone in isolated areas that were commonly thought of as lover lanes. They were. It was on moonless nights. It was often on the weekends or on holidays when he knew that people didn't have to go to work the next day so they wouldn't maybe be found or thought of or, you know, accounted for. People wouldn't be looking for them. Or maybe he himself. That was prime opportunity for him because he didn't have to be at work the next day. Right. He's like, hey, it's Friday. I'm going to go kill some people. I'm here. I'm ready. (laughs) And so you'd stalk these guys and he'd wait for the couples to get intimate. Like I said, when their pants were around their ankles, he knew their defenses were down. That's when he would attack them. So he would come out of the dark, he'd ambush them, and then he'd shoot them with a gun. Once he had shot them, then he would finish them off with a knife. And most of the time, that crime would end in a ritualistic disfigurement of the women. But I'm just definitely getting, like, major Zodiac vibes from this guy because 
it was kind of the same thing. So the Zodiac liked isolated places, and he really liked to go for people that were on, like, lover's lanes as well. Right, a couple. Mm -hmm. And so he didn't necessarily have the same modus operandi of, like, doing a knife and a gun, but he had very much the same victim profile that he picked. We're talking about the Zodiac killer. Mm -hmm. And then he, like... Also has never been caught, even though we think that we should have caught him a long time ago. We have our suspicions. Right. This guy, on the other hand, was not as uh, engaging with media as the Zodiac was. So maybe he just liked to kill people and be under the radar. Who knows? So one of the biggest pieces of the puzzle in the monster of Florence Florence case is the gun that he used. So it was a very specific Beretta twenty two caliber shotgun pistol. It says pistol. Some say shotgun. I'm... I, as far as I know, a Beretta is a shotgun. That's my understanding. Right. So just kind of depend on where it sources you were using. They, I think when it comes to like the Italian culture, maybe they don't differentiate like us Americans that love our arms. Right. Well, some of us do. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. I don't have any guns, but <laughs> so the w- unique thing about this was that it had a faulty firing pin that left a very specific mark. And so it, They had absolute certainty that it had to be the same person. However, it sounds like the reason that they didn't link it together for a long time was just that they weren't communicating, which is something that we saw. So basically part of the issue, it sounds like, might have been jurisdictions, different jurisdictions. Yeah, jurisdictional issues are always an issue. So, I mean, I think that we saw in crime periods between the 60s and the 90s a lot of the time that a lot of serial killers got away because especially if they went between states, no one was talking to each other. Right, even in separate counties, that's an issue. Right. Well, I mean, even in our county, that's an issue sometimes. <laughs> so I think that that was, that was probably similar to what happened here. A lot of these things happened in little small towns, and the police would go out, and they just weren't communicating. But the interesting thing about this firing pin is that it was always the same bullets produced before 1968, even for the 17-year period, which I'm like, I don't know why you'd keep the same ones, but here we are. So who was our uh, first unfortunate scenario? Well, the first ones were a man and a woman. The woman was named Barbara Lochi, and the man was named Antonio Loblanco. They were both married, but they were married to other people. And so this was an affair? It was. So on Wednesday night at about midnight on August 21st, 1968, which is two days and 20 years before my birthday, just saying, two lovers were spending time alone in a woodsy area in La Strada Asigna, a small commune outside of the outskirts of Florence. So apparently there's a lot of these little communes that they have outside of the metropolitan area of the bigger section of Florence. I did a lot of Italy research today. (laughs) So in the back of the car was Barbara's six-year-old son, Natalino, and he was sleeping. So I'm like, okay, first of all, you're cheating on your husband, right? Second of all, you are having an affair with your ch- kid in the back seat, but I mean, here we are. Who am I to parent? I guess I'm not doing that, but whatevs. So they're getting hot and heavy, right? Getting the thing, and then all of a sudden, this person comes out of the bushes and sneaks up to the car before they could even realize what kind of danger that they were in. They were both shot and killed on the spot. It was said that at two o'clock in the morning, her tiny son goes to a house about a mile away, which I'm like a six year old walking a mile away. That's insane to me. But he knocks on the door, and the guy looks out and is like, what the heck, who's here at this time out of night? And the little boy is like, hey, I'm tired, my dad's sick, um, can you take me back home? Because my mom and uncle, and uncle is uh, used often in Italian culture to talk about someone that's a friend. So when I, we were growing up, we had lots of uncles that weren't actually uncles, which is very popular. So he, when he refers to uh, the uncle, he's talking about his mom's friend, essentially. And he's like, hey, they're dead in a car. So the man... He doesn't really seem too upset about this. Right. It's all really bizarre. Like, look, I got to go to bed. It's it's late. I'm You're, tired. It's, My right. mom's dead. It's I just fine. walked a mile to get here, guy. Well, and he... I mean, given it's a six-year-old, I have a six-year-old, and he is not a good witness to anything. (laughs) Couldn't even tell me where his baseball hat was today. So he changes his story quite often. So he says that a man took him on his shoulders to this house and then rang the bell for him because he was too short. Then he goes on to later say all kinds of things, which we'll talk about next, but he is just not a reliable witness in all of this. Being six? Right. (laughs) And so they say that this is an open-shut case, right, because they think 
that her husband, Stefano Melli, who was apparently considered mentally slow, I'm like, I don't think we say that anymore or why that has any type of bearing in this, but it was in numerous resources. So I was like, okay. But apparently they think he did it out of jealous rage. However, this woman had many lovers. She had apparently... No shame. She brought her kid. Right, no shame. Well, and she had three brothers. They, the da Vin- the Vinci brothers, not Da Vinci, just Vinci, that she apparently had relations with. Her own brothers? No, no, just a, oh, like she- a group of brothers, Christ. but not one, three of them. Oh, okay, so, okay, <laughs> so, okay. Oh, oh, so she kept it in their family. Oh, my yeah. God. Yeah, thank God it wasn't hers. <laughs> I was like, oh, my God, why are you having an affair in the car? Just go home. Well, with the kid and brothers, I mean, she, like you said, she clearly is just getting jiggy with it. Right. So her husband, Stefano, was convicted of the crime. They thought that the evidence that they had against him was that there was a glove showing that he had positively recently fired a gun. He confessed, then recanted his confession, then confessed again, but also said that the Vinci brothers were involved. And then he came back and confessed again and said he did it by himself. So he had a motive because apparently he was jealous and his wife was betraying him with other men. But if that's the case, why is he homies with the Vinci brothers? I don't know. And then he said he was at home sick in bed, which wasn't a great alibi for him. So Well, that never is. But that's all they had. That was their evidence. Okay. Very circumstantial. The son, on the other hand, he had a couple different versions of the facts. So one of which was that his father was there when the shootings occurred, that one of the Vinci brothers was there when the shooting occurred. Then he said that his father wasn't there at all and that he had seen no one that he recognized. So again, this is a six-year-old doing his best. But, I mean, here he's got this influx of attention. So, of course, you know, six, he's six. Well, and how, I mean, this kid's in the back while they're getting jiggy with it. A, how does he not wake up for that? B, he doesn't wake up during the gunfire. And, like, there's trauma. Like, first of all, like you said, he's sick, so he's not reliable in that regard. And if you just saw your mom and her boyfriend. Uncle. Right? Uncle Ed. Dude, getting on Uncle it. Dude, like, yeah. what, what you know, what was this mind state of this poor kid? I mean. Right, exactly. Well, we're going like, to him. And his, my, his main priority is that he's tired and he wants to go to bed. <laughs> it's not my mother's been shot. When her dad, his dad's sick. <laughs> Don't we know this? <laughs> So, in spite of all of the different stories and in spite of the son changing the... His versions of events. Right, numerous times, the husband was actually convicted and sent to jail for 14 years on this extremely loose circumstantial evidence. It was actually a light sentence because they thought, so I guess this is where the slow, which is sober, not a PC term, came into it because they thought that he didn't have the right infin- infirmity or he suffered from the infirmity of the mind and was deemed mentally and in- intellectually dysfunctional. So I would say probably not competent to stand trial, which if that's the case in American law, like if you're not competent to stand trial and you don't think that you can present a good of defense, then you're not going to convict this guy of any years. You're not going to be like, oh, you're not competent, but here, let me get you a lighter sentence. Right. So, really interesting. He, the gun was never found. So, there was never a Beretta recovered. There was never a gun, period, found. And so, they said that the dad, Stefano, said that he dropped the gun at the scene, but that was never the case. We never found it, so. So, basically, he's not even corroborating what happened at the scene of the crime. Right. His stories are factually inaccurate. But once again, going back to Amanda Knox, we've seen that, you know, Italian interrogation (laughs) methods and justice are not necessarily above board. So, I mean, can you imagine in the 60s, even here, 60s to the 90s, what we were doing in interrogations? Like, people would say anything just to leave. And, I mean, this man, if he had no part of it, his six-year-old son just saw a murder and other things and so he's probably just trying to get home to him i'd say anything to get home to my kid so she's the first victim right so that's case is closed so six years later on saturday night september 14th 1947 stefania patini i'm gonna kill these and pascal i'm not even gonna try were parked in a countryside in the town of borgo san lorenzo in the miguelo area just outside of florence so these couples were regulars to the spot and been getting there, had been going there to get 
jiggy with it (laughs) and spend some private time together for over a year. Their dead bodies were found the next morning. He was on the inside of the car, leaning on the car door on the driver's side, and she was on the grass behind the vehicle. She was undressed, and she had been stabbed on the surface. It wasn't deep wounds, but it was like she had been stabbed over 90 times. Oh, my God. Rage much? Right. And then she had also been violated with a thin branch of an olive tree. So this is the first time, uh, well, one of the rare times, I think, that we find that he, there was some type of sexual aspect to these murders. And he never does it himself, from what I've gathered. But, I mean, I could prove myself wrong. I wonder if he was impotent and took his rage out on her. Because stabbing someone 90 times, that is motherfucking rage. Mm -hmm. He spends so much more time on the female. So either he has mommy issues or girlfriend cheating on me issues or combo. Like jealousy, like why don't people love me? Or impotent issues. Right. (laughs) (laughs) He's jealous everyone else can get it hard and he can't. Correct. So they found his wallet, the victim's wallet, and they found their purse. But all of the money was still in there. So there was never... It seemed like a robbery motivation. So they weren't really sure why this person was doing what they were doing other than just killing people. And so this murder was never solved and there was never anybody convicted for that. For Florence, this seemed like a one-off event. It was a horrible murder that seemed unlikely to be repeated. Even though it just happened six years ago. But they didn't link it. So they think that this is a one-off and it's never going to happen again and it was atrocious until... Saturday night, June 6th of 1981. So we're actually almost at the anniversary, or we're about the anniversary. Mm -hmm. And he goes through, like, he's not a spree killer. He goes through some serious periods of break. So on Saturday night, June 6th, 1981, Carmela de Nuccio was 21, and Giovanni Faggi were 30. They were parked in a dirt road outside of Florence in the area of Scandici, a short distance away from a popular nightclub, the Anastasia Club. Like Stefania and Pascal, the couple were in the habit of going to the spot alone together. The next morning, their bodies were found. They also had been shot and stabbed, and Giovanni was left in the driver's seat half-closed, while Carmela was found about 20 feet away from the car. Her jeans had been pulled down, and shockingly, her pubic area had been cut out and taken away. Oh my god. Yeah, it's intense. I don't even know how you manage that. Why would you do that, Jack the Ripper asshole? Right. I mean, he clearly hates women, so I mean, I guess cut their private areas off. Okay. So once again, they found their purse and their wallet, and nothing had been taken. However, this case was quickly connected to the double murder in 1974. I don't know why. I guess because, I mean, I don't know why this one made more sense. Maybe it was these two areas were closer, or they were in a... Closer amount of time? I mean, not really. But they did find that the ballistics proved that it was the exact same gun, a Beretta twenty two uh, caliber long rifle, which had the same bullets with the letter H embossed on the back. So this crime gave the police some certainties. The first of all being the nineteen seventy four crime was not a one off incident and that they had a man or a maniac on their hands. They also found that this killer was strong and robust since the woman had not been dragged but lifted and carried out of the car and down a hilly slope where her body was later found. This double murder led the police to follow their first line of investigation in the Monster of Florence case, which was Peeping Toms. So, as you know, since you've been there, Florence is surrounded by hills, woods, and countrysides, and just driving 15 minutes out of the city will take you to to a deserted field or the woods. And many Italians tend to live at home with their parents until they get married, which means that they don't have a lot of private alone time, which is why a lot of these guys would be going out to try to find lovers' lanes, just to get a little bit of private time, which I still think teenagers do this, but I mean, maybe it's just me. So making love in parked cars was commonplace for a lot of these people. Because of this, peeping toms and onlookers would hide behind bushes on the countryside to spy on these young lovers. So peeping toms was a prevalent issue. That's what you're saying. Yes. It seems very common. So most peeping toms would go into the woods with simple binoculars, but it was not uncommon uncommon to also find professional voyeurs. I can't say that word. 
uh, equipped with the latest night vision devices, as well as cameras for taking pictures and filming. Thank God. I, apparently they didn't hear of porn. <laughs> well, they wanted to make their own. <laughs> so because this was such a common problem, the police thought that they would be able to get leads or tips on people that may have been in the woods spying on other people or just out there that same night. So they went, my assumption here is that they went to the peeping toms and said, did anybody stand out? Was there somebody that gave you the bad juju vibes? Pretty much. And they did find one person who seemed to have seen so- saw something. So his name was Enzo Spalletti, and he was heard talking about having seen two dead people in the woods. The police had nothing to go on, and they jumped on that chance to find some type of lead to figure out where what happened to this and where, you know, where to go from there because right. they had no idea. So Spalletti, a husband and father, was taken into custody. I, I don't know how they linked from that, but here we are. So the reason that he was arrested and incarcerated. Wait, hold on. Spalletti was a peeping Tom, a married peeping Tom. A husband and a father. Okay. All right. And so they went to find him because he had a tip. And instead of asking him about the tip, they just said, hey, we're going to arrest you. You must be the one. Well, why are you walking around talking about that? But, I mean, Maybe. So he was taken into custody and he was incarcerated because he didn't actually want to speak about what he had been doing in the woods that night. Shocker, husband, father. Mm -hmm. But they had all said that all these witnesses had said that they saw him there. So, but he denied that he hadn't, he had been there at all. He was expected of being the monster of Florence just because he seemed to know about the death. So because he said that he saw those dead bodies, he obviously must have been the one that did it. And because you're not going to talk about being a peeping Tom, then you're guilty. So that was kind of their line of thinking on that. That's not a big leap. (sighs) It wasn't a big leap. However, on Thursday night, October 22nd, 1981, Susanna Cambini, who was 24, and Stefano Baldini, who was 26, had parked their car about 10 a.m. on a country road in Calizano, a rural area just outside of Florence. We have a theme here. They were not regulars to this particular spot, and the police just thought that they had stopped there on a whim out of desire for intimacy. (laughs) So, (laughs) this looks like a great spot to fit. (laughs) Or something like that, yeah. (laughs) So... The bodies of the couples were also found the next morning. This time, the young man was found inside the car wearing just a hat or a shirt and his underwear. The woman had been carried to a spot nearby, so very similar to the other crime, and the intimate part of her body had been disfigured. It became clear at this point that this was a ritual that the twenty-two caliber killer needed to carry out each time. Now he has a different name. So he's the twenty-two caliber killer. Sometimes he's the monster of Florence. It... Once again, they found their purses and their wallets and nothing was taken. So this double murder was considered at the time and still today an anomaly in the series of killings attributed to the monster of Florence. It was committed on a Thursday night, not on a weekend or holiday like we talked about before. It was thought that the monster preferred to act on a weekend because he had to get up early for work the next day. So we talked about that as well. But on this Thursday night, it didn't work with the theory of that he had to get up and go to work the next day because it was Thursday. So this was this was odd because it was an outlier in his ritual. And he is a very ritualistic man, clearly. He has the same MO. He does it on the same days with the same group of people around the same age in the same types of spots. So it's kind of weird that he kind of went out of his norm for this one. So that threw him off a little bit. Also, his prior cl- crimes had been in the summer. This one was in the autumn. And his other cr- prior crimes had been committed on moonless nights. This one was more brightly lit. So. Now, was she stabbed as viciously as the other ones? I didn't see stabbed, but she was mutilated. So, once again, he did the mixture of shooting them and then using a knife in some way. Okay. So in this particular case, a shoe print size 44 was found in the mud. This shoe print, although impossible to attribute to with total certainty certainty to the killer, is considered likely to belong to the monster and confirms that the police are looking for a tall and robust individual. After this crime, the uh, 
Enzo Spalletti was still in jail at this time. So he was still incarcerated when this crime happened. Well, they had to release him because now it's... You can't be in two places at one time. Right. So their guess that this peeping Tom that didn't want to talk is Not wrong. Not gay. Right? So he goes. So on Saturday night, June 19th of 1982. So now we're picking up speed because before we had much more space between them. Now we're getting a little bit closer. And Antonella... And Paulo were parked just off of a provincial, s- provincial street near some bushes in Bas- Bacchino? Bacchino? I cannot say that word either. I don't know what that one is. I'm All our Italian fans, I'm butchering it. I'm sorry. But this is just south of Florence. The car was parked plainly visible from the street. In fact, some friends of the couple had driven past and could clearly make out who they were in the car. So they weren't necessarily secluded? Not as much as other ones, no. This couple had chosen a slightly busy area where cars often pass, opting for less privacy because Antonella was afraid of the monster of Florence. So we also saw that a little bit with the Zodiac Killer going back to that, where couples were more on high alert and they started to be more cautious of things and start thinking about that. However, this did not work for her. And, I mean, they, it didn't, it didn't pan out. Right, her caution didn't pay off. (laughs) No, definitely not. This double murder was unique because it was the first time that one of the victims had made an attempt at getting away. And following this incident, the investigators seen what was like a very big lead in the Monster of Florence case. So Paulo had made an att- a brave attempt of getting away from the attacker. He was actually able to turn on the ignition and start the car. However, the vehicle was parked with its rear pointing towards the street, which would mean that he'd have to try to back out and reverse while being shot at. The autopsy showed that Paulo had been struck by a bullet while trying to get away, which made his attempt even more heroic, but still futile. So Paulo did, however, manage to get the car across the street go- by going in reverse, which led-, led to getting the back wheels stuck in a ditch and the car being able to move any further. The monster of Florence then shot the headlights of the car so that the headlights would not attract any attention. Both of the victims were shot to death, but they were not stabbed and there was no disfiguring ritual which was carried out on the woman, likely because the killer had no time and the unpredictable turn of events forced him to make a quick getaway, mainly because they were trying to move, they were in a less secluded spot, and shortly after a passing car stopped. So some things that are kind of coming to mind. He shot at the headlights, so either he was... Very much aware of, okay, if this happens, I'm going to do this. If that happens, I'm going to do that. Which suggests to me that this person has the ability to respond at the immediate crisis or turning of events. And the fact that the shell casings of the, of the bullets are decades now old, to me suggests that he knew that the bullets would be of oh eventually be of interest so i'm kind of thinking a cop you know it's funny that you say that because speculation especially on like smaller web people like web sleuths as they call them they actually do think it's law enforcement very much so they think that the i guess you mean you have two different types of serial killers i mean well you have various types because you have spree killers and whatnot but you have either very organized killers or you have disorganized killers and those organized killers like this guy he does have that hindsight in the organization using the same weapon a ritual a very consistent modus operandi he probably has a job he has a house he could even have a wife so we see that quite often in a lot of these people like the golden state killer Killer. yes that's exactly i mean the man was a cop right until he got caught or he Got busted shoplifting items to kill his next victim with. So, right, you see this in BTK. You see this in um, Ted Bundy, where they're charismatic. They have jobs. They do all these things, and they're very organized. This person does give those vibes very much. My, so. you know, just the fact that he shot the, he knew to instinctively to shoot the headlights out. To me, suggests this is probably law enforcement, but this is just a suggestion. Well, and I mean that would make sense why it's been unsolved and why a lot of these linkages weren't made, you know, because a lot of these 
really smart, intelligent, organized killers do tend to involve, especially like the law enforcement ones, tend to involve themselves in those investigations. They want to get the updates. They want to be at the scene. Right. So, I mean, that's very highly probable. And the other thing I think that's interesting when it comes to his organization is that as organized as he is and ritualistic as he is, he took a severe risk to attack someone in a less isolated area. Right. And that, again, we're going back to back different locations and a a different night. So he's stepping out. Maybe in his mind, he's getting a little bit more bolder, taking a little bit more risks to achieve whatever it is that he's looking to achieve in these murders. Or, I mean, devil's advocate here, he's devolving. He's getting sloppier. So, I mean, when he had time between the murders, he was very clean. Now he's picking up speed and he's impulsive. Because as much as he thought about shooting the headlights out, there's a certain level of the fact that he was so impulsive and making that kill was so important to him that he took the risk that they were less secluded and he finished it. Right. You know, he had That's to finish it. That's entirely possible. That is entirely possible. He was not anticipating the guy to fight back, so I think that really threw him off as well. So, like I said, a car stopped, and seeing the car stuck in a ditch, the driver thought that it, there was an accident. He stopped to help. Police and ambulance were immediately called, only this time there was actually a victim that was alive and taken to the hospital. And he was still breathing, but he did die shortly after getting to the hospital because he did get, he was shot. So prosecutor Sylvia Della Monica was investigating the case, decided to enact a strategy to try to get the monster to make a false move. She had the papers write that Paulo, before dying, was able to say a few words at total falsity, but that at the time was believed. Shortly after this, so she does this whole political ploy, right? She throws that out there. They want to see if the monster of Florence will bite. Soon after, an envelope arrived at the, I have to say this, like in ta- I have to like say it in my mind in Italian, Carbonieri police station in the heart of Florence. Inside, there was a newspaper clipping with the article dating back to the summer of 1968 about the two lovers who had been shot in the parked car in La Ostra Asigna, a crime that Stefano Milli had been convicted of. Someone had written on top of the clipping, why don't you take another look at this case? And that's exactly what they did. The shells of the bullets from the 1968 murder, which were still attached to the archive, and the ballistic test soon proved that the same gun had been used in 1968 was the very same gun that was being used currently in Florence. So still had not connected it, just finally connected it. To the very first one. The murder. killer had to say, here's the biggest clue, guys. Hello, look over here. So, I mean, once again, Zodiac vibes. So he did actually interact with the press, which not to the level of Zodiac, but he, I mean, very much Zodiac vibes with this guy. So it seemed like an open and shut case back in 1968 because of the jealous husband and the promiscuous wife. However, they were looking at it more closely. They started to question whether the events had actually evolved as Millie and, to a lesser degree, his six-year-old son, Natalino, had recounted. What if Stefano Millie had merely been a pawn in the machinations of the Sardina clan? The brothers. Yeah. It could have meant that one of them did still have the gun. So that's kind of what they went back and looked at, was that maybe they were still at some point connected into this. So once again, the police are still very much chasing their tails. So they're like... Well, maybe the Vinci brothers have this. Maybe Millie had just been wrapped up into it because they were having an affair and blah, blah, blah. And they felt like they had gotten their first concrete lead in the Monster of Florence case, that these petty criminals, the Vinci brother boys, that they might have been involved. So they started looking more closely into all of those those boys to see why or if they could be connected. And they decided that the two brothers that probably were the most likely to be involved in this were Francisco Vinci and his older brother, Salvatore. But something was discovered that was very odd. Shortly after these most recent killings, and shortly after the prosecutor had put this false news in the newspaper, Francisco Vinci's car was found in the south of Tuscany, hidden in the woods. So Was he in it? No. So he decided to hide the car, or... I yes. mean, I, that would be my assumption. Either he killed himself or he's hiding the car. Yeah, he was not in it. So definitely hid the car. 
and they thought that maybe he had hit it because he was in some way connected to this case. So they go down, they bring Francisco Vinci into custody because they think that he's the monster of Florence. Then we got it right. We're almost we're getting closer. No, we're not. On Friday night, September 9th of 1983, in Galuzzo, a residential area of Florence, two German tourists, which is now kind of a change too, Ewa Rush, 24, and Horst Meyer, 24, were relaxing, listening to music, and reading in their VW camper van. One of the men was slightly built with long blonde hair, the sort of guy who at quick glance would be taken for a woman. Shots were fired outside the van through the window, which was shattered, but whose glass did not fall to the ground. The killer was unable to see and had to switch to the other side and continued to shoot to the other window, then entered the vehicle to finish the job only to discover that he had preyed on two men and there was no woman to carry out his ritual on. So once again, I think we're seeing that he's getting sloppier. Maybe right, because I think in the beginning he was stalking them. That was the mm-hmm. understanding. Watching them, waiting for the sexual intimacy to begin to basically catch them with their pants down. And these guys are just reading. So he's not stalking. You know, I just... Hmm, I, it, I don't know. It, it doesn't make sense. But uh, maybe your suggestion of he's just getting sloppy... Is exactly what's going on here. Because oh, you bring up a good point. I mean, when before he'd hide in the woods and he would go to these popular lover's lane areas and he'd lie in wait for them. Now it feels like he's just picking these people out of the air. So it's like, how did you even find these two guys? You rolled up and you thought one was a woman because he was of slight build. So it's just, it feels like there's not a lot of logic there. This crime gave the police yet another piece of factual evidence about the identity of the monster of Florence, his height. So now we have that we, we have a footprint. We know he has big feet. We know that he's probably robust. We know that he uses the same gun. And now, because the windows of the van are much higher than the car's windows, and the bullet hole, which remained in the shattered glass panel, gave a clear indication of how tall the murderer murderer is based on where it was fired and what height he would have to be to hold a gun they found that he was about five feet ten inches so (laughs) similar to when Enzo Spalletti was in custody they now also have to release Francisco Vinci because he also has a very good alibi (laughs) can't have done it I was in jail so the monster didn't seem like he wanted anybody else to take credit for his actions However, the investigating judge on the case, Mario Rotella, was absolutely convinced that the solution to the crimes was to be found in the Vinci brothers, and that the connection to the double murder in Lustra Asigna in 1968 was meaningful. So even after releasing Francisco Vinci, Salvatore Vinci, Francisco's older brother, was then arrested. I mean, like, like literally, we're just grasping straws here. Right. If it's not you, it's you. Come here. Come here, the other one. Other it's like, ah, oh, crap, that peak. I mean, Tom didn't do it. Okay, well, we'll just check him off the list. Okay, this brother was in jail, so it wasn't him. We only have one more person on the list. Had to be the brother, the other brother. So Giovanni Melli, which was Stefano Melli's brother, was also brought in for questioning, as well as his brother-in-law, Piero. Although they were not part of the Vinci family, they had also been mentioned by Stefano Mealy in his insistent ramblings about what transpired on the night of 1968. So it's really interesting because now we have all these other crimes and we're still just only focusing on 1968 and grasping at straws from that particular group of people instead of pursuing new leads or, you know, like even thinking in our head, maybe none of that was actually connected aside from her being the victim. So I'm wondering if they even bother taking any type of physical evidence from these gentlemen. I mean, we have a, f- a shoe size, and we have a potential height. I mean, did these gentlemen even match what the evidence is telling them, this is your guy? I mean, it sure doesn't seem like that, because their grounds for thinking that these guys had motive was just that they all wanted Barbara Lochi out of the picture. I'm just going to put this as crudely and bluntly as I possibly can. 
they were all getting it with this woman. Like, I highly doubt they wanted to kill her. Like, And that would be my understanding. They all were aware. Right. That they, they were all involved with her. I mean. And plus, too, if she was their only target or that they were jealous, once she was dead, case is literally over. Right. You don't continue to do these things to other people. You're not throwing someone off the track if you're doing it five, six years later. 100%. Why would, Especially when they have someone arrested. Right. Why would you continue to kill people if it was just about this one person? Right. I mean, the lover I get, her I get, but like you said, all of these other victims, why? And these poor German men that were just reading their books. In German, probably. Right. So, it they believed that Lochi's promiscuous nature and her habit of changing lovers from week to week would have been an embarrassment to the family name, and that's the perfect motive for why they would want to get rid of her because, you know, family honor and all that jazz. So they also thought that Mealy and the brother-in-law were involved in the 1968 crime because they were also suspects thought to have the same type of gun. However, on Saturday night, July 29th, 1984, Pia Rontini and Claudio Staffacci were parked in their usual spot in the woodsy areas in Vecchio near Florence. At 9.45, they were both shot and stabbed to death. Pia's body was dragged to a nearby area, and the killer carried out his ritual mutilation, this time through taking it one step further. He also cut off and took with him the girl's left breast. But he dragged her. He didn't carry her. Right. I mean, maybe he was was getting older. This is like 17 years later. He's like, whoo, my back. I can't lift it like I once did. (laughs) So, uncharacteristically, at this scene, there were two clues left, one of which was the handprint at the top of the car, leading investigators to believe that the killer held the gun in his right hand and steadied himself on the top of the car with his left hand, thus making him right-handed. There was also knee marks on the side of the car, confirming the height of the killer. Yet again, the monster of Florence had struck while holding their suspects in custody. They had no choice but to release all of the men previously stated because they had a but solid alibi. But they have alibi. fingerprints now. Yes, right. Now we have more evidence. However, the police don't give two flying fucks about the evidence, obviously, because it's like, I see, I see the height. I raise you this short man that may have been jealous. <laughs> like, okay, guys, carry on. So, while initially they, it seemed like there was a certain connection to find the solution to the crimes, it was all turning out to be a dead end. And again, this man strikes on Sunday night, September 8th, 1985, in the Via Scopietti near the San Cassiano, a town outside of Florence. Nadine and Jean, two victims, one being 25, go Jean, and his older cougar girlfriend, Nadine, who was 36, had put up a tent near their car just off the main road in a clearing behind some trees. So once again, we're breaking M.O. because, yes, they had a car, but they were not in it. So this couple was French. So we now have a number of Italians, a German group of dudes, and a French couple. It was a clear sign that residents in the Florence area were no longer brave enough to venture out to the lover's lanes in these rural areas because of the monster of Florence. But... These poor unsuspecting tourists, however, who just wanted to camp, they had no problem because they must have just not known. I mean, I would imagine it was well publicized, but regardless, they were out living their best life. So Gene Michael was a strong and young man who was a trained sprinter. And when the monster opened the front of the tent and surprised the couple, the French man managed to burst out of the tent and try to run for his life, but was hit by a bullet in his arm. Okay, so I'm just saying, if you're my boyfriend, given that you're still, like, 10 years younger than me, if you fucking run (laughs) and leave me there to die, I'm losing it. Well, the relationship's over. (laughs) I mean, it ends tonight either way, but I mean. (laughs) I'm like, hashtag, this is why I'm single. This is it right here, because he just leave me to die in the tent. So, unfortunately, he is a coward, and he runs for his life, not judging. He just ran, whatever. But he runs the wrong way. So he runs in the one direction. In one direction, if he would have ran that way, he would have cr- quickly arrived at the street. But the direction that he took was running straight into the woods. 
So, I mean, this is legit like every horror movie ever where you run and they're slow walking behind you and you're like, oh, no, it did And then you trip over air. <laughs> right. <laughs> so that's what this guy does. And the killer get, catches up to him and finishes him off with his knife. He then goes back to the tent to perform his ritualistic mutation. Mutilation. So he's already shot the girl. Because I would have been long gone. Right. Yeah, um, yeah. Well, needless to say, she got left. So I'm pretty sure she was the first one shot for sure. So he goes and does this ritualistic mutilation on her body. I didn't find specifically what that was this time. And then the next day, an envelope arrived to the prosecutor who had played the trick on him in 1982. The address was written as if it was a ransom note with letters cut out of a magazine. And there was a spelling mistake. Once again, Zodiac vibes, just saying. So this gave the investigators another small piece of information to try to understand the type of person that they were dealing with, an uneducated person who did not understand or know how to spell very common words in Italian. Or it's, it's a red herring. Or he just, because it says that he was missing a B. Well, maybe his magazine only had one B. We don't know. I feel like we're real judgy right now. So I don't know. Killer? <laughs> Killer much? <laughs> Why are we judging this poor man? <laughs> the envelope contained no letter or message, just a small sliver of Nadine's breast. Oh, my God. Yeah, this guy's sick. So the French couple, so it does talk about mutilation to some extent, so obviously he cut out her breast. The French couple, Nadine and Jean, were the last victims of the twenty two caliber killer. At that time, the authorities thought that this envelope was sent directly by the maniac was a warning that there were more violent crimes to come. However, in hindsight, it was possibly more probable that this was a goodbye note because he never did it again. I wonder if he ran out of bullets. Ran out of bullets, maybe ended up in prison for a different reason. I mean, they believe that the Zodiac Killer could have died and that's why he stopped. So, I mean, we just don't have any idea. But once again, the biggest thing in this situation, the biggest outline factor was the Beretta 22 caliber pistol. So it was so specific and so rare that it was shocking that they were never able to link it. The gun was used in 1968 for what seemed like a motivated crime carried out by people who knew the victims. So the gun was used in 1968 for what seemed like a motivated crime carried out by a person who knew the victims. That same gun and the bullets were used from 1974 to 1985 after a significant break for a spree of serial killers that were far closer. So we had a pretty large gap before, and now we have all of these other murders that are in a, like, 10-year span, and the other one was, like, six years out, seven years out. So... But it was the same gun. And so these spree killings, they were carried out for no apparent motive on random couples who the attacker did not know. So I think that really threw them off, too, was that there was gaps. That although it was the same weapon, that some of the motives changed. But they were, to me, pretty consistent. Well, the victims were pretty consistent. But definitely there is an evolution of sloppiness that evolves here. I think so, too. I think that he definitely... For whatever reason, I mean, when spree killers normally start to go on sprees, there's like a big break in life. So before, I mean, I think the police really could not break themselves of the thought that this man or this other crime was an outlier, A, because of the distance between the crimes, but they really thought that that was personally motivated, which I don't think is the case. I think it was just his first kill. It was just... How do you compare as someone's getting more sophisticated, but yet when he's going into sprees, it does seem like he's getting sloppier. His underlying stays the exact same. But they could not get around the fact that that 1968 murder, they felt like it was very personal, whereas these other ones felt very erratic. And it's like, I don't think that's the case because you're assuming this other one's personal. And what if it was not? What if it was also a crime of opportunity with two strangers? And I think it was the second one that he stabbed 90 times. Not the first one. No. And, again, there's a big gap. And I'm thinking, okay, well, maybe he was military. Maybe he was in prison in that time. I mean, these are significant. Or maybe he was married and the wife died or the wife left him. 
And then he was kind of free to resume his killing. Yeah, I mean, it could have just been something that he tested out and then it stopped because that urge was fulfilled. And then, like you said, like a significant woman figure in his life died or left him or did something that caused this to then evolve into a spree killing. Because, like I said, it's the second victim that gets the rage. I, there is, and there's a gap. So my thinking is something happened. Like, like maybe he got married and, okay, maybe it was a, maybe he was an ex-lover of hers and then he got married. He, He killed her, end of story, got married, but she either cheated on him and left him and there's that rage again. And he's not really stabbing the second victim. He's stabbing Barbara again. I mean, I'm just speculating. But to me, he was triggered to come back. It does seem like that. Anytime you you switch into that spree, there's normally like a preceding event that happens. Right. But, I mean, you bring up two really good points. So, I mean, I think that they really liked the Vinci brothers because they were criminals. They really liked... Stefano because it was open closed and so those are just really easy ones for them to pick up but the other interesting part of all of it I think is that as much as those were easy ones and they couldn't get past that you're right the second person did have so much more rage and to strangle someone to stab someone is so much more personal and intimate so to say that that first killing was personal seems far off when, like you said, the second killing is so much more personal when you're stabbing someone 90 times. And then his mutilation is picking up speed. So, you know, his mutilation went from fairly minor, I mean, we started off with sexual molestation, so to speak, with a olive branch, olive twig, olive stick, to then mutilating their private areas to cutting off their breasts and taking them with them. Right. I mean, there's obviously... A sickening that is occurring, but and 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 it also c- might be something to the effect of he's coming to understand how how much power he has over the dead bodies. I, I mean, who knows? Yeah, it just definitely does like to for them to think that the first one was so personal. I think, like you said, they're ignoring how personable all the subsequent ones were. I mean, they were drastically personal mutilation all of that stuff and i think the second one is the only one that he sexually violates with a olive branch from what you have shared i think that's the only one so maybe she was even something of interest to him as well but i think she was young i mean he just has evolved his mo is very consistent in a lot of ways but it just slowly picks up speed as it keeps going so They speculated about the gun and why they could never find it and all that jazz. And one of their possibilities was that the gun had remained with the Vinci brothers and therefore that was where the monster of Florence could be found because once again they cannot leave the Vinci brothers alone. I don't know what the obsession is. Or that the gun had passed hands and that the Florence maniac had nothing to do with the Vinci brothers. It's like, well, duh. Obviously it's one or the other. So they really think that that specific gun at some point had belonged to the Vinci brothers. And so either they still had it and were the murderers or they had sold it and got rid of it. And that person was the murderer. But that I didn't find any information specifically on when that gun went away or why they believed this to be true. And one of the things we do have to remember, whatever, however much we research the shit out of something there is always information that's withheld from the public. So, I'm again, I mean, you're repeatedly saying that they couldn't get past these brothers. There might have been something we did not know. Right. Like, they believed that they had committed some other killings somewhere else. But, again, we don't know that information. So, I, it's hard. It's hard to decide were they in the right, were they in the wrong kind of a scenario. Well, and the other thing that's kind of interesting is that they make this gun seem like it's so unique. And it's like, yes, it has the defective firing pin. And yes, these bullets all have the embossed H, but maybe all of 
the bullets in that because I mean I don't know I wasn't alive then clearly or in Italy for that matter but maybe a lot there was a whole part of those bullets that had the embossed H so that's not really as rare and maybe that particular Brunelli shotgun all had me like defective firing pins like I get that maybe like once again we'd have to see the ballistics report so maybe that marking is that clear that it could only be that one gun but it does feel like they are just convinced that these guys have this gun for whatever reason and it's them right okay 100 percent during the course of this investigation aside from the gun they had all kinds of reasons why they believed that they had a hard time believing that the crime was carried out the 1968 crime was carried out by the same person that did the 1984 to 1985 crimes, even though they were very similar in my opinion. And so they reached out to a number of different people to try to figure out what they needed. So the Florentine investigators had a profile of the monster drawn up to better understand. They used Francisco Di Fazio, an expert criminologist and head of the Department of Forensic Science and Criminology at Medina at the time. And he developed a profile with the following characteristics. A solitary killer, does not work with any other people, is a bachelor and likely to have no significant relationships with women at all, perhaps even other people. He was likely impotent, just like he said, due to the fact that there were no sexual acts that were ever committed at the scene of the crimes. And that he also used the olive branch to violate his first victim. That he was about 40 years old in 1985 which would make him 73 years old now. Assuming he's alive. If he was alive, yes. He was probably right-handed. He was more comfortable using a knife than a gun. He was a lust murderer, so killing excited him, and that he had no stable job. So they dispute the fact that I think he was more organized. They think he has no job. This, The Florence investigators also asked the FBI in the United States and they developed a profile, which was that the man was about 45 years old and comes from the area of the killings. He was a manual laborer. He was of average intelligence, a bachelor who lives alone or with an elderly person, that he lived in close proximity to the first killing, no relationships with women, and likely has a sexual dysfunction, and may use drugs or alcohol to pump himself up for his crimes. So it's kind of interesting there because those two profiles – have a lot of similarities, like they had the same age range. They both thought that they was a bachelor. They both thought that he was impotent and had no relationships with women. But one person thought that he worked, and on top of that, worked hard. I mean, manual labor is difficult. The other one thought that he had no job. So it's kind of interesting. But it would explain why he was carrying the majority of the women and the child, supposedly, that mile. Right, how he's strong. Right. It would also make sense that he had a job to get to and so that's why he did it on the weekends so those are kind of interesting because I think it was kind of fun to see where our minds went before getting to those profiles and kind of seeing where we landed because I mean I think I jived more with the uh, FBI profile so this maniac was really hard to catch because he had continued to manage to escape capture he they were asked why they were not able to catch the killer. And the uh, magistrate, Francisco Fleury, he said that there was a number of reasons for why this case was so hard to solve. So he said one of the reasons was that the killer was working alone, which made him so much harder to catch because he wasn't working with other people. And they Except they have his fingerprints. Right, and his footprint, and a high, and a this, and a that. But... This is interesting because he says that he works by himself and that there was not enough people to be involved or clues to find because he was solitary, yet they were so stuck on the brothers who innately probably would have worked together or had an idea of what they were doing, especially since they were a quote-unquote clan. Right. So his second reason for why it was hard to solve was that the the murderer had no relationship to the victims, which made it impossible to find the connections between the crimes and the motive, which is also interesting because, once again, this is in contradiction to the belief that the police had that it was very personal, at least that first one. So another reason was that the victims were chosen at random, casually, merely for convenience. There was no pattern. 
The murders were carried out very quickly, in less than 10 minutes, and the killer was gone. The pauses between the murders were very long, which mean that meant that he had time to regroup and pl- replan perfectly, which isn't necessarily the case towards the end, so that was kind of an interesting one. That only in 1982 did they discover the connection with the 1968 murders, which was an important factor, but is yet to be understood how it times in. And the killer had to point that out. Right. On their behalf. <laughs> Once again. Hello. So, and that does baffle me a little bit. Maybe he wasn't, you know, the part of the Florence Police Department or, uh, you know, Pelosi. I'm not sure what they, how they're pronounced, how the police is pronounced in Italian, although I've seen them. And it just seems odd to me. I mean, between the two, they definitely have, like you said, similarities, but then they have these stark contrasts. And I am in the camp of he had a job and he was either military or police. Yeah, I mean, he's very efficient in how he kills. Like, I could just pick up a gun and go kill someone, like, effectively to incapacitate two people that quickly. And then kill them, finish killing them off with knife, which is hand-to-hand combat. That is something that's often trained. Right, and he's cutting up body parts. Right, and then to mutilate, like, anybody would be like, oh, God, well, you know, I mean, there's just a certain level of, like, that takes some level of expertise and a different mentality. Right. So they think that this case ultimately has not been solved because the Italian police that handled it just didn't really have any experience dealing with the serial killer. Which we've seen in our own country, especially in the early 60s, 70s, and 80s. And again, when DNA was not, and not that it's even sounds, it doesn't even sound like it's something that's even applicable to this situation. But again, you have the his handprints, guys. Yeah, I think that's why a lot of the victims are going back and really trying to, victims' families are going back to try to get it reopened is because they're like, hey, you know, and we've seen that, like you said, in our own country where we're like, yes, we couldn't do this back then, but hey, if you still have some DNA, can we try it again? Like, let's see what's going on now. Right. And, you know, perhaps after some time, the mentality of the police department has shifted. Whereas, and not only that, but experience, you know, unfortunately, with every murder or series of murders, there's experience gained. Right. So... Yeah, so, I mean, that's the monster of Florence. And he got away with it, that son of a bitch. Yeah, I mean, they, it's quite the tell. I mean, there was just so much to it, and I think it was just handled poorly, which, like you said, we saw a lot in the summer of the serial killers, which was like the 60s, 70s, where we just didn't have enough experience, we didn't talk to each other enough. And, I mean, despite the fact that there was multiple trials, multiple people brought it in question, multiple people even prosecuted and convicted for it, we found that none of them was the right person. So he still is out there. Right. And the other thing, too, you've compared this scenario to some of the killers here in California, Zodiac Killer, and we've mentioned the Golden State Killer. It's funny, and and going back to the mind frame of this time, and I'm certainly not, trying to sound negative, but even the mentality here, the Golden State Killer was seen by a neighbor being a peeping Tom, and the neighbor guy just thought, oh, this young kid's just boys will be boys mentality and kind of whistled at him to let him know, I see you, and the Golden State Killer got away. And, I mean, he goes on to kill other people, and here they had this, this guy had this moment, where his mentality was, oh, boys will be boys, and not, this guy is looking to kill. Right. So definitely mentality has something to do with the time as well. And here again, that that shifts. It shifts with the unfortunate more killings that occur between now and then. So. Well, and then, like you said, with that parallel to the Golden State Killer, I mean, they're around the same age. I mean, he was how old when he when we just got him? I mean, this guy would be, like we said, 73. Right, about the same time, right. Mm-hmm. 73, 78, so, I mean, around that same age. So it's kind of interesting. And then with them having so many peeping Toms and it being such commonplace, like you said, like, I mean, especially when I used to be a PO, those entry sex crimes 
they're like class B's and they're lower level sex crimes, but they potentially go up. So. Right, the, the gateway, basically. Mm-hmm. Yeah, kind the of. The gateway drug. <laughs> right, right, yeah, right. for sure, of like serial killers. <laughs> so, I mean, it could be possible that it was just a person that was out there being a peeping Tom like everybody else that slowly escalated because of resentment or jealousy or the fact that he was ina- unable to sexually fulfill his needs. Or someone else, or a woman's. Right. Right. Definitely. So, on our way back to the U.S., I thought it might be a little bit fun, because like we talked about at the beginning, I was in Rome for six weeks, and I spent a lot of time there. I figured we'll take a little pit stop on our journey and stop in Rome to the Capuchin Crypt. So, this crypt is, it's a crypt and museum, and it's commonly called the Bone Church of Rome. So if you have not been there, people that are going to Rome, like the Trevi Fountain, the Colosseum, the Sistine Chapel, all phenomenal, all worth going to. But the Bone Church of Rome is equally worth going to. And I, believe it or not, I've been to Rome twice, and I have not heard of this. So do tell. It's a very low key. I think it was only because we had been there for so long that people are like, you need to try this. So the I'm going to call it the Bone Church because I like that better. But the Bone Church is located in the center of Rome, and it's not it's really close to the Piazza Barberini, so it's within walking distance to the Trevi Fountain. So it's kind of off a side street away from the Trevi Fountain. And it is a series of crypts that's below a church. And I'm not even going to try to say the church because I'm going to butcher it, but basically you walk, this beautiful church is built above and. It was made by Franciscan friars that moved away from the old Franciscan order because they didn't think that they lived humbly enough. And so they wanted to go back and like back to basics, essentially. So you go in, you get into your museum, and then you go down into this crypt. So it's more like a catacombs. It's down under the ground, and it's kind of cold. It's only lit by small windows and like very dim electric candles. I'm sure it was original candles back in the day, but we're like, we can't have this on fire. And you get down in there, and there's, like I said, six rooms. So one's a chapel, and it has no bones. The other five rooms do. And it's the bones of 4,000 monks down there, friars. Okay. And so holy men. Yes. And so they holy rollers. donate their bodies, essentially, when they die to this chapel, and it, they've decorated this whole chapel with their bones. Okay. So just a couple highlights of this place. There is two mummified arms that are arranged in the coat of arms for the Capuchin friars. And then there's two guys, gave you a little picture so you can look at it, but there's two hooded individuals that are down there and the skin of their face is still attached to their skulls. Oh my God. It's super creepy, but it's morbidly beautiful because they have chandeliers made out of their body. They have these elaborate Baroque designs made out of their bodies. Right. And so a lot of people go there and they think it's just a tourist attraction, but the Order of the Capuchins really wanted, yes, like the monkey, someone asked me that the other day, but they really wanted to emphasize that we're mortal and that we should reflect on our mortality and the passage of life and that thus, in doing so, reflect on our sins and whatever sins we feel like we have because life is so short. And so... That's what they really want people to do when they're down there is not just like gawk at the dead bodies, which is hard not to do. My 19 year old self definitely did it. But they want you to really think about your morality and sit in that peace and that silence of what it's like to know that you're passing through life. And you're you're a passing phase, baby. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Well, I know the our listeners can't see this, but I'm going to try my best when this gets released to put this picture or a link to this crypt because like i said i i've been there twice and i've never heard of this this is pretty awesome and you know the 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 thing i mean what a concept you know there are other crypts we know of the ones in, in paris but i mean this one sounds more like they had an objective here they wanted you to think about kind of letting shit go, it kind of sounds like, and just being grateful for where you are at. And present. Correct. Correct. All right. So that is what we have for you tonight. So the monster of Florence and this awesome Capuchin crypt. I probably mispronounced that in my Italian. It's just as bad as my French. 
But on to business. So Facebook, Facebook, Facebook. I have a Facebook page. And if you are curious or interested and would like to join, send a request. And if you have a topic or another monster, uh, European or American, does not matter to us, that you'd like us to cover, send me an email at where the dark corners are at gmail.com. Final thoughts, Slasher Samantha. Well, this guy's fucked up. That's about it. That's all I got. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. It's been a blast. I stumbled through it, and I'm glad that we experienced it. It was a good time. Yes. So until next time, please remember, only the few can find the beauty in the darkness, which is why we hope to meet you where the dark corners are. on the back of the casing. So it was a little H. So the cops would know this is our guy. Same guy. There was no doubt that it couldn't be him. He's he's trying to help out. (laughs) Oh, baby. I don't know what's going on, but we're going outside. Sounds like allergies, poor thing. He does not like the monster of Florence. It was a clear sign that the residents of Florida, no, or uh, the residents, it was a clear sign that the residents in Florida, oh my gosh, I keep saying Florida.